Hello, today we are interviewing Carlos Jerez, uh, Director of the Institute of Mathematical and Computational Engineering, Associate Professor at the School of Engineering at the Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile, alumni of LICS. Carlos Jerez, welcome and thanks for being with us today. Well, thank you for inviting me. You have spent several years at LICS. You've done master's and a PhD program, and now you work at PUC. So actually, I have two questions. Uh, your research subject, do you continue it? What was the research subject and uh, do you work on it now? And the second question, is there any difference or uh, common points between LIX and PUC? Okay, these are great questions. So let me start with a refreshing memory. I, um, when I started doing my PhD at uh, LIX, I worked with Jean-Claude Nedelec and also with a, a professor in uh, Besançon on the modeling of electromagnetic waves and acoustic waves in uh, piezoelectric substrates. That sounds like Chinese, but what this is, is actually something that happens in every cell phone. Every cell phone has a little device that somehow manages to filter some of the signals that we get from the antennas into a proper signal that is the one that we choose to talk with. And it's extremely efficient. This was about 10 years ago. Back then we were just thinking about 3G, 4G, and uh, what we did was modeling from a mathematical and physical standpoint these processes. Um, this was actually part of a project financed by the uh, NRT through a CIF uh, doctoral scholarship, and uh, there were. Th th it was a beautiful combination of academia, industry, state working together. So. I learned a lot from that experience. I think that was probably one of the uh, main main um, points that attracted me to do a PhD here at, at X. Uh, the fact that you could work closely with real companies on very complicated problems using high level mathematics. So um, that research uh, it developed somehow. Uh, I stopped working on the uh, cell phone uh, and filtering processes themselves, but I continue working on wave propagation. And today I'm working on wave propagation of uh, sound, for instance, in uh, the sea to hear fish, for instance, and detect the size of the fish schools and help fishing to be a, a, a sustainable activity. I'm also working on energy uh, harvesting, which are devices that take um, light and other sources of energy and transform it in a way that the device themselves, imagine your cell phone, just gets charged by uh, just being there. So no need to, to connect it to something. And this is all through mathematics. And this is the, the amazing thing. Once, once you have a very good standpoint, uh, a very good basis in mathematics, you are able to do these kind of things. I'm also working on the Big Bang. I never thought I would ever work on the Big Bang. I'm currently working with astrophysicists in Chile, modeling telescopes that capture the energy from the Big Bang to understand how the universe was formed. And then the last thing also related to this is work with anesthesiologists on how to use electromagnetic fields to somehow anesthetiate without using uh, chemical substances. And this is uh, a, new, a new branch of, of, the, of research that somehow it is developing. So in a way, I started in a, in, a, in a very concise, concrete project on a particular application, and this has been branching out in several layers. Uh, and the fact that I could discuss and interact with people from physics, people from uh, the industry, and mathematicians, of course, has really helped me uh, advance my, my, my career. I'm currently very happy doing this. So now, when you ask me about uh, what are the common things uh, between PUC and LIX, uh, I think the first one, uh, and what are not common points? Of course, the, the first one common point is, is both an engineer, so where I'm coming from is an engineering school, but uh, of course it's not as uh, famous and, and, and old as Ecole Polytechnique. Um, we, we are probably looking at leaks as an example of engineering in several ways. We're also looking at other, at other universities and how to um, 
progress and how to adapt our curricula. We're constantly modifying our curricula. Uh, we just launched a big reform in the way we train future engineers that I think is very similar to the way uh, Polytechnic is also trying to, to form the future engineer. So uh, there is this, this um, elements of, 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 of transversality, of general knowledge, of being able to go abroad, uh, of uh, having a solid mathematical basis, um, and physics and chemistry and so on, but seeing also the future as an interdisciplinary effort as well. So this is also something we're, we're, we're very much uh, targeting to. I think, obviously, uh, well it's, not, it's, it's not obvious, but I think Polytechnic has done this in a very brilliant way. And uh, I think that's, that will be the common grounds. Now, um, we are also working on our doctoral schools, on our master's levels, uh, on, uh, on trying to bridge the gap between academia and industry in a better way. So I'm currently uh, creating an institute. Uh, this, this institute you mentioned is just being created. And it has a very concise uh, or, or very precise objective, which is to bring applied math and computational engineering to industry, education, things like data science, uh, things like optimization, uh, high performance computing and so on, mixed together in a way that is useful for society. Of course. So on the same subject of our two institutions, there is actually a double degree agreement that exists. And so uh, up to you, um, what is its main objective and what is its state today? So <laughs> I, I would say probably one of the first double degrees uh, that the School of Engineering uh, in, at PUC had with any other university was this one. So I think the agreement between Leaks and PUC started somewhere around 2003 and ever since has been a, a great aspiration for many of our students to be able to get this double diploma. So usually the students that come over here are our best students. Um, for instance, in 2015, the number one and number two in our ranking were X engineers. So uh, clearly, Polytechnic has today a, a very, very strong image in, in, in Catolica. Um, the agreement today is being renewed, so this is why I'm currently here. Um, and we're changing it in a way that is, makes it easier for our students to join Polytechnic and then stay to do either master's, doctoral degrees. We're also working on how French students, so students, uh, Polytechnicians, can actually come to Chile and better arrange their curricula so that it's easier for them to take different courses, make it a bit more broad, and also the research in uh, the different places. So, and parallel to that, we're also working on how to make uh, stronger connections between researchers at both institutions. So we believe that we can, con we can connect at different layers, not only on the student level, or on the grad level, the graduate level, but then also on the researcher level. We think there's a lot of things to be uh, done and uh, currently uh, we, one of a former Chilean polytechnician student, so from Catolica, who studied here, Carlos Singlong, um, did his PhD in Stanford and now he's uh, part of our group. So we're very happy to, to somehow strengthen the collaborations with Polytechnic. Of course, very beautiful, very beautiful project. Uh, maybe you know, at Ecole Polytechnic we support and appreciate entrepreneurship. We actually have a center entirely dedicated to entrepreneurship that is named Drai X Innovation Center. It was inaugurated one year and a half ago and now it's a unique spot for startups and entrepreneurs uh, to co-work, uh, to, to negotiate with investors and to create. Mm. As I know, you have co-founded several entrepreneurship projects. For example, Capital, the private investment market for renewable energy projects in emerging markets, or Athenium, a global knowledge sharing program. I also know that there was an HCM front, a software service on, uh, related to human resources. Could you tell us more about your entrepreneurship projects and activity nowadays? 
Well, I, I have to say there's, there's one, uh, one thing I realized when I was doing my, my, my PhD is that uh, there's not such a big difference between being a researcher and an entrepreneur. Maybe the way it's done is very different. Uh, the way you get funding is very different. But the, but the essence of it is the same, is going into a project that, or a vision of something that you want to achieve uh, without really knowing how to get there, and then just working hard, using your talents and maybe the help of other people, so networking is always very important, to achieve those goals. So in research, you're going to see this through a grant where you, had a, you will have PhD students, you will collaborate with other researchers. In an entrepreneurship, what you will do is, well, try to convince someone to believe in your idea, the same way you get a grant, uh, try to sell them a pitch, uh, try to work on the idea, and then probably your idea is not, a, is not going to be a very good idea at the beginning. But what's important in, in both areas is that you push forward and you keep trying to make it work and never give up. So that's the, those two things are very, very similar. You should not give up. Sometimes you have to admit, okay, this is not a good idea, but you always find a, a parallel way or, or a branch out or, or, or a continuation of that original spirit. So in many of the projects uh, that I've started, uh, and I would include even the Institute uh, of Mathematical Computational Engineering, you start with one idea, one vision, and you start facing it with the public. In this case, it would be the authorities at university or, in, for, for example, this software platform for human resources uh, is based, well, who's going to use this? Who's, who, who's going to appreciate this work? And once you start discussing the, with the users, with the insights, so potentially your clients, uh, right, in a, in a very broad sense, then you start realizing, okay, well, maybe I didn't fully understand your, your needs, and I thought you needed this, but in fact you needed something else. So <clears throat> one of the beautiful things also is that um, I'm trying to combine a little bit of the mathematics and the structure of, of, the, of the engineering thinking, which I think is it's, it's, it's a great thing, with things that are not necessarily engineering type. So human resources and engineering usually doesn't talk to each other. Okay. Uh, knowledge, yes, there's a lot of knowledge somewhere, but it's, it's, it's somehow people can express and, and transmit knowledge in a better way than a book, a whole book on something. I mean, you don't, maybe you don't have time to learn about this. You just want to talk to someone. So giving this these insights on what is really needed, what is, what is, what is the variables that, uh, or the pain points, as they usually say in the entrepreneurship environment, once you really get to that, then of course you need to say, well, how do I make money out of it? Right? That's, sometimes you don't make money for a long time. A lot of very famous startups still don't make any money, but they're very valuable. Um, but it, it's, it's, uh, it's about creating a vision of, or believing in a vision of where you want to be, of where this idea could be, and then just try to find the means to get there. Um, so in, in a way it's a navigation. I would say it's, it's, it's uh, I always compare startup as a, as a, uh, as a little boat made on, on paper, by just doing some you know, origami. origami, and then you put it in the water, and then you hope there is no, no storms or no, no, no one throws a stone on the, on, the, on the little pond where this is flow, floating, because it might turn it down. But then as time passes by and you start adapting and learning, then your little boat is no longer made of paper. Maybe it's a bit made of wood, and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, hopefully. Um, I also don't think in these crazy ideas, um, people say when you want, to you want to be an entrepreneur, then you should drop everything and just launch yourself into it. I think if you're, if you're young, yes. If you don't have commitments, fine. But in general, life is not like that. So you always have commitments. You have to make uh, a living. You have to finance a family or, or something. So what you need to do then is work more. It means you have to start trying the idea, trying to test the idea, and if it starts developing somewhere, then okay, then you invest more time on it. Uh, sometimes people say, no, it's not possible. I think it's possible. It's just uh, maybe, maybe drinking more coffee, working hard. Um, but in any ways, entrepreneurship is not an easy thing, and research is not an easy thing. People have this impression sometimes, but they're not easy things. 
and it's going into the unknown and pushing forward a belief that maybe this is where I want to go. At the end of the day, you may not be there, but this is your guiding star. So you need a guiding star through the navigation process. So that's... Um, thank you very much for your beautiful answer. It was really a pleasure to listen to you. And thank you very much for being with us today, Carlos Heres. Thank you very much.